All right. Today we got Stephanie on the show. Stephanie, how are you? Good. Good. So, uh, Stephanie, you have been listening to the show for a very long time. When I saw your email name, I was like, oh, I remember her. Like, she's been around a long time. So, thank you very much for sticking with the show for so long. Yeah. One of my favorites. I appreciate it. Uh, so, Stephanie, you emailed uh, a, a while back and you kind of gave a very brief summary of your experiences. And you said you just weren't ready to talk about it yet. And since then, uh, through prayer and, you know, just comfortability, you're now ready to talk about these experiences. Uh, your email has tons of different experiences and details. And, and even from, so we got the paranormal stuff, uh, the you dealing with going into witchcraft, Satanism, New Age, dealing with Ouija boards, mediums, things like that, uh, to you coming out of that and becoming a born again Christian around 2012 ish, but you're you also have these experiences with, um, which it all it's all perspective as to how you view these things. But you have these experiences where like little scampering, uh, little people scampering around my house. Uh, you saw a gargoyle on your neighbor's roof, and some of these you contribute to more spiritual vision. But then you have things like saw a plant being across the street, which you said was a physical thing. And so there's a lot of different things, possible BEKs. Uh, Your husband has even seen small creatures running around. And uh, also, you are now involved with Hector's ministry, which sounds like you are now going to be heading it up, which I find interesting. If if I'm mistaken in that, you go ahead and correct me. Uh, But anybody who's listening to this who doesn't know who Hector is, uh, he's from episode 227. It was a member show, and it was a very fascinating show because Hector um, very much believes uh, in the power of prayer and healing. And even before we started the recording, he prayed for my brother and I because Jack was in the studio with me, and Jack's shoulder was healed before we even started the podcast recording. And so Hector... Uh, was like an instant fan favorite when people found that show and stuff. And uh, now you're working in the same ministry, which I find really cool too. So I'm going to uh, backtrack though. And we're going to start, we're going to start talking about your paranormal experiences. Uh, we're probably going to dive into the childhood and uh, we're going to kind of navigate these waters the best we can. And just before we started recording, you had said that you forgot to put one thing in there, which is something that I just want to start with because it seems like a good starting point because, you know, what's what's better to start at than at the very first day you were born? Well, we got a memory of you talking to Jesus before you were born. So that's even better. So uh, I think that's a good spot to to jump into. And uh Let's go. Where, where do we go from here? Um, let's see. Well, I remember talking with Jesus, Yosha, um, and he came to me asking me if I would be Alana's mom, my oldest daughter. Um, he said, it's not going to be easy, but I would like you to be her mom. And I said, okay, I will be her mom. And then there was a group of me and other moms. We were all to be moms. and. She was gathering us all and asking, okay, who wants to be this one's mom? This was Cyan, and who wants to be her mom? And I was looking around. Nobody was uh, taking up that call. And I said, well, why not? You know, I can be her mom too. And he said, you sure? It's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. And I said, yep, let's do this. Um, It wasn't like a long memory, but. I remember seeing like clouds and blue and white and he was tall and I can't imagine why I would make up something like that. It feels, feels like a memory. I understand. Uh, so, cause I, I, I don't think I even mentioned the fact that you do have memory gaps in your life. Uh, and sometimes they come back to you and, uh, we'll get into that and how you attribute these memory gaps uh, in a little bit. Uh, now, so this memory that you have seems like, did you know the child's name then through this memory? Like, did he, like, was a name already given to the child or is that something that like you actually gave to the ch- your daughters? Um, those were the names I actually gave to them. Um, I can't remember specifically if he 
called their name. I don't think so. I think it was more, he had them in his hand. He had them, my daughters in, in his hand and say, will you be their mom, her mom? Um, and I said, yeah, yeah. Like it was just, and it's not even like, I remember there's individuals like beings, but I don't remember. It's kind of hard to describe, like just clouds and bright and peaceful and and robe, like a long robe in his hand. He's like, will you be her mom? So, and the image of Jesus, now there wasn't like a, a very detailed image to your memory. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Correct. I remember like long flowing hair, but not super long, like maybe shoulder length, brown or dark, just a darker brown. Um, like skin color, I don't even remember. I find it really interesting because I have this, I don't know if we should call it a theory or a thought, but I've heard plenty of people's experiences, whether on the show or I've heard it on, you know, different podcasts or YouTube videos or whatever, of people, you know, dying, going to hell, going to heaven, having an experience where they came face to face, face to face with Christ or, um, the Godhead. And, when you have these experiences right, relayed back, when they come back, there's plenty of times where they describe the physical attributes different than the former person or the next person. And mm -hmm. there are people who, who question authenticity when they hear somebody say, like, uh, we had, uh, I think his name was Jason and his wife were on the show and he had something happen like that where, uh, and he came on the show and relayed it. And he, I think if I remember correctly, he said that, it, Jesus looked like the guy in that, that, that movie or whatever. And th I know there were people that were like, well, that, that's impossible because Jesus was uh, from the Middle East. So he wouldn't have looked like that. He wasn't, you know, white Jesus, this, that, and the other. And I started thinking, how is it possible that people have these experiences and they don't have the same description of Christ physics, physically? But then I started thinking, okay, well, let's see if the answer is in the Bible. And we see throughout the, with, with Christ's resurrection, the people who knew Christ the best didn't recognize him when he was, when he was rose from the grave. So mm -hmm. it wasn't that he looked a certain way, got, you know, pummeled, beat up, physically destroyed. And then his body in three days was healed. He walked out of the tomb and looked like the same old Jesus that they remembered. He looked completely different to the point that Mary thought he was, I think, the gardener of something like that, if I remember correctly. And the disciples were like, he comes up alongside them. And they're like, what's wrong? And they're like, oh, we lost our friend. And they spent time walking with him, telling him, Jesus that they lost Jesus. And it wasn't until they realized who they were talking to that they broke down. And so to me, I, I wonder if there's this thing where somebody who is you know, born and raised in Africa, let's say, you know, um, I don't know, Kenya, just totally different culture, but they, they know about Jesus Christ, they're Christians, their mental image of Christ would be very similar to what they know around them out of comfort. That happens a lot with people. You know, they, they picture Jesus the way their society and culture they're, they're comfortable with is around them. And so would Jesus Christ have any opposition to appearing before people in the most comfortable manner for them. I don't think so. I don't think so. Right. So it's just a thought that I had. And when you said what your experience and the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of detail kind of makes me th feel like, well, yeah, no lot, not a lot of detail because you weren't born into any, any, you weren't born yet. So you don't have any experience of, you know, where on planet earth are you going to be living? The people around you, what, what does a human being look like? You know, things like that. So uh, it would make sense to me that there would be no real clear image of Christ in that moment. But I don't know, lots of theories, lots of theories. Yeah. So um, let's talk about your childhood. It seems like you had a lot of um, different things, maybe difficulties uh, while you were sleeping from night terrors to waking up on the floor uh, waking up with razor thin cuts on your body. Uh, very, very interesting thing. So if you could just kind of go into your childhood and some of these experiences and share with us, you know, what happened? Um, let's see. I would always have nightmares, uh, where I'd wake up either screaming or yelling or, 
I would even hit myself awake, <laughs> not on purpose because that hurts. Um, nobody would sleep in the same bed as me. Like my sister wouldn't sleep with in the same bed with me because I'd kick her. Um, I'd kick the walls. Um, I would have nightmares about aliens and zombies before even all the zombie movies. Um, all kinds of weird, weird things. Um, but yeah, I would wake up with cuts on my arms and legs and have no idea how. Um, at the time, we didn't have like cats or nothing sharp on my bed to cause that while I'm sleeping. So there would be no reason to have those cuts. Um, I would wake up sometimes outside of bed, um, like facing a wall. So my, my parents would make fun of me and uh, say that I would sleepwalk and run into the walls when they they don't know if I really did. Um, but they would always find me on the floor somewhere in like the hallway or another room. Um, so it makes me wonder if I did sleepwalk or I would even fly in my sleep. So levitate. Um, I remember flying, <laughs> flying around like the schoolyard or downstairs. Um, I could jump down a flight of stairs because I could fly down them. Um, so I'm wondering if I was actually levitating and would wake up elsewhere in the house. I don't know. <laughs> so do you, these uh, experiences you had, do you kind of attribute it to a spiritual attack then? Is that kind of uh, the angle that you feel was happening as a child? Yes, I do. I do think I had um, like generational type curses, like demons trying to get me since I was little, probably because they knew which direction I'd be going as I grew up. They didn't want me to go there. Wow. It, the fact that you said that really... You almost said it word for word as to how I feel about that stuff too. I, I feel like just the just the idea of a satanic entity that's been around since Adam and Eve, you know, resisting and 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 battling against God. You would think that like he's not omnipotent, he's not omnis omniscient. He doesn't know the future in the sense of outside of what has been already ordained. Like he can't, he doesn't know my next move. I believe this. Uh, but I think that he's not stupid and he has a long time to observe human beings. And I think that there's this possibility that he sees certain characteristics and traits in children where generally speaking, when you see those kind of things, that child goes in a certain direction that he, maybe he doesn't want. And so there could be spiritual attacks then that ensue to try to deviate that said child off course. Is that what you were saying too? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, uh, you were raised Catholic and uh, yeah. it, it seems like in the email uh, that experience wasn't great because you said uh, raised Catholic, but turned away from a mean God uh, around 10 years old. Could you go into like, you know, why, why, like at what, what point, in this Catholic faith that you were being raised in that, that some experience or what that made you feel like this God was uh, a mean God and you didn't want to follow this God at the age of 10. And then you pursued, you know, witchcraft, Satanism, new age kind of things. Um, it started with like repentance. Um, I remember being told we had to ask for forgiveness through the father, um, like the, I don't even know what you call him, the, hope for pastors at the church um and i couldn't understand why like why why do i have to do that um well so you don't go to heaven or i mean don't go to hell and i remember asking my mom well that doesn't make sense so if i don't ask for forgiveness for stuff i did then i go straight to hell um and she would say yes um and I, like or for like lying i just couldn't understand i couldn't grasp like the gravity of it and how she would explain it. Um, that if we didn't wear the nice clothes, we would go to hell to church. If we didn't say the right prayer to receive communion, then we would go to hell. If we didn't um, say the right things, then we would go to hell. Like if we didn't get married the right way, then they would go, go to hell. Like it, none of that made sense to me. Like, well, if it's that easy to go to hell, then why even try? Because I'm going to fail already. It's how I saw it that young. So I wanted nothing to do with that mean mean God. I wanted nothing to do with it because 
he was so mean. I didn't see any, any love in that at all. Like, so the gospel was never explained to me. Right. So like the accuracy of the gospel message was never relayed to you clearly exactly. uh, because that's a yeah. very common thought process amongst people out there uh, that, you know, God's a big meanie uh, that you have to do certain things to be, um, to be considered in his good graces. And there, the, there are good graces with God. Grace is a huge part of it, but it's, it's not as oriented around what you do, but rather who you know. And that's the, yes. that was the disconnect for you, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so even with the, the Lot's wife, how she turned back to look at the city and was turned into a pillar of salt, nobody could explain to me why. Why would a God be so mean to do that to her? Um, but I got all those answers as I grew up. Gotcha. Uh, so that happens. This whole new philosophy in your mind of uh, rebelling against God, or um, well, yeah, it eventually did, did lead to that uh, that those actions, rebellion against God. But just this idea of disbelief, this idea of um, not wanting to follow a God that uh, could be so horrible, uh, pushed you into the opposite direction. And uh, how'd that whole process start for you? Um, yeah, big rebellion. I would wear shirts that had cuss words on them, but I would censor myself enough where a teacher wouldn't get upset. Um, I would dye my hair and pierce myself and get tattoos when I was really young, um, 13, 14, um, just doing whatever I wanted because it was more fun. I could do what I wanted. And since I was going to go to hell anyways, might as well make it fun while I was here. Well, that's a very uh, juvenile approach. You know, that, that's, <laughs> that's what kids do, right? So, I mean, kids that are rebelling w would do exactly that. I never had the guts to get a tattoo as a minor because my dad would have beat my rear end, you know? <laughs> so um, <laughs> so what, what was it that kind of uh, launched you into pursuing like the occult and witchcraft and new age type of things? And what was your experience there? Um, well, I, a lot of it was more jealousy or envy of my sister who she like she had things uh, where she could with her command basically control the weather if it got too windy and she didn't want it she could say stop the wind now and within 30 minutes it would stop um or if she wanted a storm she would command it to happen and there would be a storm coming in um or there was another time in the front yard we were doing yard work i went in briefly and when i came back out she was like did you see that and i'm like what she said a fairy landed on my hand um she described it as like blue or purple maybe it was blue purple um but it was a little person a little girl like a tiny mini thing um she said it said something to her but she couldn't understand it and then it flew away and i remember um our mom asking her like you sure it wasn't like a dragonfly or a bug and she's like no it was a fairy <laughs> it was a little person um, and then she could, she could sense like, like the supernatural. She can sense other spirits. You know, she could be like, you know, this so and so passed away. Talk to me, and I'm like, why don't I get that? I don't understand. So then, um, once I had the opportunity to go into like witchcraft and Satanism, um, I call it an opportunity, but it's not really. Um, I would delve into the Ouija boards. Do. Um, the writing stuff, uh, get tattoos and piercings, listen to all kinds of music, get get the Necronomicon. I would um, chant spells and um, anything you could think of. I was dabbling with blood and uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, but nothing, of course, nothing fruitful came of it. So uh, I just kept getting darker and darker and darker. Um, and that's about the time when some severe depression started hitting too, where I was like self-harming and just trying to find love in all the wrong places like that song. Um, um, let's see. Just like, oh, and that's about the time. Oh, it was a little shortly after. I'm pretty sure I was already out of high school in my early 20s where I... I know I was arguing with somebody and I can't recall who 
or even what I was saying. And I was smacked back. Like I couldn't feel the physical smacking, but the only way I can explain it is I was shoved back about six feet. So I was behind myself. I could see my hair, the clothes I was wearing. I could tell it was me. And I'm yelling, like super violently yelling at somebody. And like my arms are flailing, like I'm aggressively yelling at them. And I'm telling myself, no, don't say that. That's not me. That's not, that's not me. And I've always wondered what that is. Like, what, what was that? Um, so that's one of the main reasons why I started listening to your show. I was hoping somebody would come on and would explain something similar. So I could be like, okay, it's not just me. <laughs> and uh, I remember going to therapists, asking them, is that multiple multiple personality disorder? Am I like starting to lose my mind? And they're like, no, that's not how it works. Um, so then I just didn't really have any answers. Nobody could explain to me what happened. So you're going to the counselors about this. They say, no, that doesn't ha- that's not how it works. Did they have any suggestions for you? Did they say, you're just crazy, you should be institutionalized? Did they have any thoughts? <laughs> no, nope. they're like, I don't know what to tell you what that was. That was it. Like, it makes me, I wish I had gone to like more of a spiritual type therapist, um, somebody that was a believer, and then they could probably lead me in the right path, but that wasn't my path. So I remember just asking, like, asking multiple therapists because I would hop from one to the next to the next because they couldn't answer my questions. They couldn't get to the bottom of, of what that was or why I was so depressed, why I wanted to harm myself, like all kinds of things. It's interesting your experience because, uh, when I was younger, I was, I was crazy. Like I was, I was nuts. And, uh, I often wanted to seek counseling. I often wanted to seek therapy but I didn't want at the same time, I didn't want to go through those steps because of what you just described. Like I was and it wasn't for me, I wasn't thinking along the lines that I was possessed or I had, you know, any spiritual as much as just I, I had a lot of rage and anger in, in me, uh, a lot of scars from my childhood. I didn't know how to heal from. And uh, I just didn't want to go to a counselor where I felt like they like because I didn't have a lot of money. And I was like, I'm not going to pay somebody for them for me to find out. They, they're not really doing much for me. They're not really helping. And then I got to find somebody else and then hope that I find somebody somewhere along the line that can help me. I, I, I just would rather just not go. And I, but um, it's interesting. Now, uh, let's backtrack here for a second. Your sister, you were mentioning about how she was like basically the, the weather lady and she could control, but she could control it. So she was more yeah. accurate than what we see on TV. Um, did she dabble in witchcraft or was she attributing this to more of a God, God, uh, spiritual gift kind of thing or, or what? Cause I assume she was raised well, Catholic too. Right. Correct. Um, but we both turned away at about the same time. So she was about eight. Um, she's younger and she seemed like she could see things. She could hear things and feel things. Whereas I didn't. Um, so I envied that, envied that, um, Yeah, she would change the weather. If she wanted sunshine, she would command it, and it would happen within 30 minutes. Sometimes it was immediate, like the sun would shine through a cloud. And I'm like, how do you do that? And she'd be like, I don't know. Um, I remember messing with the Ouija boards, and we'd ask different questions, like, how does she get that? And I don't. And they said, my brain was too big. (laughs) So that that nothing like saying you have a big head. Um, (laughs) Uh, or it would be aliens. That's what we were talking to. That's what we were told we were actually talking to through the Ouija board was aliens from the planet ABC, um, which is kind of funny. Um, but we played with that for over six months. We made our own um, Ouija board and played with that for a while. And then things would start moving on their own. And we thought it was weird. Um, like, for instance, there was one time where we were playing with it with our stepbrother. And a pair of scissors I had noticed was getting moved closer and closer to his head, where if it fell, it would hit him in the head, probably not seriously injure him, but it would hurt. Um, Like stuff like that, just little things would start moving or little things would disappear um, that I had just used. Like I used a color pencil to draw um, a rose and I needed the red to make the red rose. And the red disappeared when I went to the bathroom and came back and it was gone. And I couldn't find it for three months. Like, where would it go? Or things would always get knocked over. Um, 
I would turn around and bags of oatmeal or like a Slurpee I had would always get knocked over. And I'd get in so much trouble because (laughs) everything was always knocked over. Um, And that didn't stop until recently, until about two years ago. Okay. Uh, So your sister has these experiences first. You're jealous of it. Now I understand why you were jealous. Um, Now, I'm assuming your sister and yourself never had any kind of formal guidance into you know, witchcraft or the occult. Uh, I'm assuming you guys as kids probably just picked it up on your own. But that leads me to the question of how did you pick it up on your own? Was it all through the Ouija board or uh, was there books that you got from somewhere? It was all actually through movies. We would watch movies every weekend with uh, our dad. Um, when we go from our mom's house to our dad's house and that was how we bonded was watching movies. So we'd watch three to four movies, go to the movie theaters and watch them with him. And he was a big horror buff. So we watched every horror movie you could think of every sci-fi movie you could think of. Um, the more supernatural it was, the more we were interested. So we, we watched pretty much every movie. Um, and that's where we learned whatever was in a movie. Um, like the movie The Craft. We were more teenagers when that came out, but that was all the witchcraft stuff. So we were chanting all that stuff all the time. Or Hellraiser, you know, with all the <laughs> pinhead type stuff. Or um, Poltergeist um, was another favorite we watched all the time. And I was maybe five <laughs> when we watched that. I remember watching that in the movie theater. Um, so I'm aging myself. Um, but yeah, like all those uh, movies we watched all of them okay and so that kind of leads to i'm sure people are thinking so are you saying that the stuff in that movie w- was uh real witchcraft as far as spells go or whatever um i personally and you might think differently but i personally feel like it doesn't have to be in the sense that like uh it's about the will as, as far as i understand and i'm far from an expert in this kind of stuff but i just talked to a lot of people right uh But from what I understand, it like even with the Ouija board, I mean, you can make your own Ouija board and it will still function. Uh, It's not about the board. It doesn't have to be from from Parker Brothers from Walmart. You know what I mean? Uh, And so is that how you view it as well? Or do you think that those were real uh, spells and stuff that you were learning? Um, I think it's a split. Um, I I believe they put some real stuff in because they want experts in that field, per se, to make it look realistic. and also some, I mean, could be made up uh, if you're dabbling in that kind of stuff. The enemy will take every opportunity to come in, what, no matter what the intention is. If you've got that open door, they'll use it. Okay. Uh, that, and that makes, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, I, I just, uh, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Uh, all this stuff is interesting to me. I, I enjoy this conversation very much. Uh, so you mentioned kind of about the getting pushed and things like that. So you're you're sum, you're sum, summarizing basically that you believe you were possessed and and how long do you think you were possessed in your life? Uh, mm, that's a great question. I just know maybe ten years. If, if I were to guess, it's so hard to know because you don't really know that you are that you have demonization that you are being oppressed. Uh, it's not in your face. At least for me, it wasn't. Um, I just thought something was wrong with me, like me uh, and my will, um, until I couldn't control it. Like wondering why I would have fits of rage and couldn't control it, or wonder why I wanted to harm children for no reason at all, or wonder why, like a four year old, should not have lustful thoughts. That's just not natural for a child to have thoughts like that. So, um, like, where do those thoughts come from? So I know, and I, I can't remember if you mentioned it here, and if you don't want to go into it, that's fine. But I know in the mm-hmm. email you mentioned about how um, this this possession, I think you were equating to the possession, but or no, is the memory loss. The memory loss that you've experienced throughout your life. Uh, and sometimes memories come back to you, uh, but you equated it to sometimes abuse that you went through but also abuse that you uh, inflicted on somebody else or maybe uh, something else. Uh, could you go into 
any of that as far as like, you know, what you experienced and how you equated to the memory loss? Yeah. Um, I, well, I went to therapy for that as well because I had PTSD pretty bad um, after my uh, second divorce. Um, it it was a lot of physical, sexual, and verbal, emotional type of abuse. Um, like, looking back at it, I should have stepped out of it, but when you're manipulated and groomed over years, to think a certain way, thinking that you're a bad mom or thinking that you're a bad wife, um, just that being drilled into you over and over and over again. Um, and somebody who can manipulate that situation can really abuse the power they have over you. So from that, I don't remember. I don't remember a lot. Uh, a lot of times people tell me what happened and I'm like, oh, I don't remember doing that or I don't remember that event taking place. Um, a lot of times in therapy, I had to work through stuff that I still don't remember to this day, but I knew like something bad happened in the garage. I just don't know what, um, or I knew something bad happened in the laundry room, but I just don't know what. So I had to work through, um, the trauma side of it just so I wouldn't have, uh, like horrible anxiety uh, whenever I was going into, um, like sitting in a chair in an office chair, and if somebody were to approach me and from a certain direction, I would have like a almost like a panic attack, which is a reaction to a trauma. And for that specific instance, it was because I was choked um, by my ex husband, and to the point where I could not breathe, and I didn't know if I was going to survive the next minute. So um, that would be why I would react in that way. I don't react like that anymore. Thank goodness. Um, so I've worked through a lot of those traumas. Um, but yeah, I know there's big gaps. I don't, I just don't recall people like my sister or friends would tell me, um, do you remember when your ex-husband would slam the door on me, um, coming out of the car? I, I don't recall that. Um, or friends would say, do you remember the time you smoked a bong? And I'm like, I have never done that. Or like, yes, you did. You were like an expert. You're showing everybody how to do it. And I'm like, what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't do that. I'm like, yes, you did. There was witnesses there. Um, to this day, I have no idea. Like, <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. Um, stuff like that. Uh, just have good gaps. Yeah, and that's interesting. Um, I mean, not in the in jovial <laughs> sense, but very interesting. I uh, when I was a kid, and I think I probably mentioned this before, but I'm a one person show here, so uh, sometimes you hear repeat stories. But uh, when I was a kid, uh, I had a really bad childhood in this neighborhood I lived in, and my family, my dad got a job driving truck at Pitt, Ohio, and life financially got better for the family where they could move out of the trailer park and we moved to a whole different school district. My dad asked me, he's like, do you want to stay in the school district or out? And I'm like, get me out of here. And um, so maybe like a month or two later, I go to visit a friend who lived on the outside of the trailer park, but not far away. And he used to always come and hang out with us uh, in the old neighborhood. So I went to his house and we went to the old neighborhood uh, and it was just, you know, a kid thing where, you know, it's a bad environment and stuff, but you still go, I guess, um, uh, nostalgia gets to you, I guess. I don't know. But uh, we would go down and we're hanging out with kids and they were all pretty nice to me now that I wasn't living there, you know? And this one kid, I remember, I'll never forget this. I, I can't remember his name, but they told me, they, they, they're like, oh, so-and-so is here or whatever. And he sees me and he uh, goes, dude. And like, like in a surprise, like he can't believe he's seeing me. He runs over and like pretty much jumps on me and gives me this big hug. And he's like, how are you? And I'm like, who are you? And everyone's like, you know who this is. This is so-and-so. I'm like, I really don't remember you. And they're like, shut up. And I'm just like, oh, I'm just kidding. I still to this day have no idea where this kid came oh, from. Yeah. Like none. And I don't know if it's because he was one of my bullies. I remember my bullies. One of them listens to the show and he he treats me like, you know, he never bullied me. And, uh, you know, I'm, it's behind me now. But uh, the the in my mind, one of the most major bullies in my life growing up, I have a burned image in my head of him to the point like when I told you earlier I was crazy when I was younger, 
in my early 20s, I just ho- happened to come across him on Facebook because Facebook recommended him as a friend to me and I was crazy. So I, I saved his picture on, on my phone and I drove back up in that area several times looking for him because I just wanted to beat him down. Like I was angry. And this kid from this memory, I still don't, I, I, I don't know who he is or where he came from, but everybody told me I was supposed to know who he was. And so I don't know if it was a trauma kind of thing where, you know, I just mm-hmm. blocked it out. Um, when it comes to your ex and the abuses there, uh, did you ever have a situation where you had an anxiety in a certain area or something in front of him? And you're like, I don't know why I feel like this. And he just kind of kept his mouth shut. He's like, I know why, but I'm not going to tell you if you don't remember. Hmm. I, not, not that I can recall. Okay. I was just Mm-mm. trying to. I was just trying to paint a picture of how much of a douche he is, but, (laughs) uh, but anyways, um, all right. So we're kind of transitioning here into more, it seems like more adult life stuff. And it seems like a lot of these experiences, uh, still continue throughout your adult life up to even two years ago, like you mentioned, uh, there's a very specific point though, in this email uh, that I'm running through here. I'm kind of just running through it in order. I'm not sure if it's all totally in order, but uh, you said in 2012 ish, uh, you got born again as a Christian. People that are listening maybe don't know that means you became a Christian, you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, and um, you learned how to cast out demons that were still in your life, like rage, uh, strongholds with lust, uh, uh, generational curses. And then you said within the last two years, so I'm assuming this was an ongoing process for you. Uh, could you just kind of maybe talk about that a little bit as far as like, what was it in your life that kind of turned you in that direction? And what was the process like going through these experiences of understanding of casting out demons and the different things going on? Um, the process that started was uh, when my daughter, my youngest, um, was injured by her dad, my ex-husband, and um, then the whole court process. I was talking to friends and they said, come to church with me, just come with me. Um, And luckily it was a church where you didn't have to dress up um, and they would play uh, secular music. Um, So there is a good thing for those kinds of churches um, where they have the smoke machines and (laughs) the lights and the loud music. And I could relate to that as somebody that didn't want nothing to do with God, with Yahweh. And, um, I felt accepted that first service that I went to, um, and I kept going every week, um, following resonating with me. Um, the scripture part wasn't yet. It was still hard to hear, um, but everything else made sense. Like what he was talking about, the pastor made sense. Um, and I kept going and kept going. I still couldn't say that I was more of a believer. That was more in 2010. Um, but it took a couple of years for me to say, okay, I I believe he was able to answer questions through all the services that I had had when I was little, um, like explain what's the difference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not a walk up a dash, like what, why are there three, but they're the same. Nobody could explain that to me until I went there. Um, so moving forward, uh, I remember asking Yahweh God for help, um, help me get through all of this hard stuff, the divorce, making it on my own as a single mom of two, um, like trying to make it in the world, like working my job, plus going to school full time, um, just trying to make things work on my own. Um, As more time went on, uh, the court stuff was over. and then I met my my husband that I have now. I was actually told before I met him about a month prior, and, and now I know it's the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, telling me, you will meet him at church. Um, so I made sure I didn't miss a single service. Little did I know it meant at a singles group through church. Um, and that's where I met him. He wasn't a believer, but he was invited by his friends who went to the same church. So we all met at uh, playing volleyball. Um, and that's how we met. Um, and I just kept going to church. And eventually he followed me to church. And he is now a believer, especially after seeing all this stuff with casting out demons. And that didn't come until oh, about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, when 
it was the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, telling me, now's the time to fully repent and clear out the system. I guess that's the best way I could think of calling it. And that's with after having multiple things in the house, like tapping, things moving, things getting knocked over all the time, um, dealing with lust, lustful thoughts, um, just things that I couldn't stronghold, that I couldn't break free from, things that I couldn't control or just will my way out of it. I would still have those rage fits and feel horrible afterwards, screaming at my children or my husband or anybody, like, why can't I control myself? And so I started looking up prayers because I didn't know how to pray. Um, So I started looking up prayers and found one on spiritual warfare. And that, to get through that prayer, it took a good 20 minutes of speaking the prayer. And I remember doing that for a little over a year every day, day in, day out, um, yawning a lot, sneezing a lot, coughing. Things would distract us, like the cat running around or the dog barking. Things that would distract me from saying the prayer. Um, but consistently over time, like I could see the light. like. Things I could have more control. It was easy. It wasn't like a struggle with myself and my will, my willpower. So then I was learning to trust in Yahweh and God and Jesus, Yahusha, more and more every day. Put my faith, my belief in them. So your husband that you have now uh, was not in the faith when you met him. Uh, and I think it's kind of cool that for him it was seeing is believing. And so even through through knowing you and the things that he experienced brought him to faith. That's pretty right. cool. Right, yeah. That's pretty cool. And he used to have sleep paralysis that haunted him since he was little, um, as an example. And as I was learning how to cast out stuff and use our power and authority in Yahusha and Jesus, um, one night I remember him uh, making these weird noises and I thought okay maybe he's just dreaming um, and he eventually was able to talk and say help me and so I remember getting up and I was like what's wrong and I was able to shake him like what's wrong and uh, he's like there's there's something attacking me and it's right over there and I couldn't see it um, but he said it was like a shadow like a staticky shadow man um, being and which at that point, since he's attacking my husband, I got mad and he said, in the name of Yahusha, I bind you and I rebuke you and I cast you out. And I pointed to the window to tell it to get out. And at that moment, uh, our uh, light sensor for our front light turned on and we could see it through the window blinds turn on at the exact same moment. And at that moment, it, I think it is when he was like, okay, there's something to this. So when when you say that you saw it, do you mean saw the the light turn, or do you mean correct? Okay, right. he he could see he could actually see the shadow thing leave, like in a whoosh, um, like as I commanded it to leave. I couldn't see it, but he could. Was this something that he was dealing with his whole life, or was it something that was more, yeah? Okay. Um, he said it picked up as <laughs> after he met me, like more activity happened. Um, but yeah, he, it was something he's had since he was young. So he wasn't unfamiliar with spiritual attacks then. Did he attribute it to it as a spiritual attack or was it more like a haunting to him? Um, I think he thought of it more as a haunting and he, nobody had really explained anything like that. He never told really anybody because it's embarrassing for him. Um, telling somebody that he was attacked while he was sleeping and couldn't move. Um, but now that we're talking to like Colin in the UK, um, who's also with our ministry, uh, that he has sleep paralysis too. So I was like, oh, there's other people. And then as he's listening to confessionals, he can hear all the other testimonies of sleep paralysis and then he's not alone in, in that. Yeah. And, and just let the audience know, I have already uh, interviewed Colin. It hasn't aired yet. It probably will air. Well, I don't know when this interview is going to air, so it's hard to tell people right now, but uh, <laughs> It, it, it probably will air before what you're hearing now. So, um, you know, Hector's interview was a member show. So at least Collins or yours will definitely probably be a public show so people can hear 
how this whole thing happened. I mean, uh, Hector was a big uh, pushing factor for some people in my show. And it's, it's whether it's like you and Colin, who actually, you know, are now working in that ministry with him to other people who just was like emailing me saying, holy cow, that opened my eyes a lot. You know, um, I, I believe that some episodes really do impact people. And, and there are people, everybody has their own place they're coming from in life. And so depending on the subject matter, it will affect people differently. Uh, but I, for me, on my end of things, when I put a show out, sometimes I just get a sense like this show might really impact people more than maybe some others would and in a, like a positive way. You know, uh, I, I think putting out a Bigfoot show could impact people in a sense where people listening that have had a similar experience can get impacted where it's like, wow, somebody else experienced that too. Uh, but this is more like spiritual kind of thing. And when I was putting Hector's show out, I wasn't sure how that was going to go because I was affected in the sense that I literally saw my brother get healed in the moment when Hector prayed for him. Hector, before we started, wanted to pray for us. He said he had a sense that we were we had some physical ailments, and and uh, Jack had said that he has shoulder pain. And it was consistent for a long time, and I looked at him like, "You never told me that, bro." And uh, so Hector's praying for it, and and Hector's like, "Do you feel like a sensation in your shoulder or something like that?" And Jack's like, "Yeah, I do," and but the pain was still there. So Hector kept praying, and Jack's face, like his eyes, got real big. And he just had this really stupid look on his face, like, what is happening? And me and Jack were raised in in a very, very Pentecostal environment. We believe this stuff happens. Like our grandfather, I've talked about it plenty of times on the show. He was very much involved in healings. And so we we know these things happen. Neither one of us ever experienced though. And uh mm. and Jack's Jack's shoulder was completely healed. And I haven't talked to him about it in a while, but I remember like when I was producing Hector's show, it was probably about six months later, getting ready to air it. I asked Jack and he said, my shoulder's fine. Absolutely fine. And so uh, I knew that for me personally, that interview had a very impactful thing for me. But I wasn't sure if other people would feel the same way because I just don't know. I mean, we have a very, very diverse audience, uh, people coming from all aspects of life. Some people listening are very much involved in mysticism, uh, the occult. Uh, some are just straight up uh, Satanists in the way where it's like, it's not that they, they believe in Satan. It's more of an atheistic rebellion kind of thing. And then there's some that pursue witchcraft and they, they truly are Satanists where they, they hail Satan. Uh, and then we have Christians. We just have plain old atheists. We have people who are more new age. We have a very diverse audience. And so I just don't, I didn't know how it would affect people. I just was, I didn't know. And when I put it out, the inner, the, the, when I put that interview out, the emails that I got, I was just like, holy cow, like there's something going on here. And then to find out that at least two people that heard that interview are now actively participating in that ministry. For me, as the host of a show that puts people's experiences out, it's very gratifying to know that we were able to do that for people. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And we still get requests in from the email that Hector put out and we still pray for people. It's great. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's awesome. And now that you said that, I would like to mention um, here on this part of the show, because if it's okay with you, I'd like to do a whole other segment with you because we're running up on the first hour here. Um, if, you, if you have time, I'd like to kind of hold you over for an overtime segment. Sure, sure. Okay, cool. Uh, so on this segment, I'd like to just tell people this Hector that we're talking about that kind of started this role, probably maybe even, I, I don't know. Let me ask you this. Do you think that if you never heard Hector's uh, interview, do you think you still would have contacted me and be on the show right now? <laughs> hmm, that's a great question. <laughs> probably, I would almost say I would still be sitting on that email. <laughs> Understood. I, was, I feel like the Holy Spirit and the Ruach HaKodesh wanted me to well he told Hector to tell me and I also received it as well to lead the ministry so yeah um and to get on the show so I could tell that to everybody and we can move forward with that the ministry 
So is Hector still involved in ministry and you're just leading it now? Yes. Yep, that's correct. That's that's really cool. And the fact that he heard it from the Holy Spirit and you did as well. Uh, what, what came first, Hector or you? <laughs> Hector. <laughs> that's even cooler. And it also shows yeah. there's there's no ego involved here as well. I mean, for instance, it, it would be very humbling for me. Like, I mean, humbling in the sense of I'd have to humble myself greatly to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit that's telling me that I should hand my show over to somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Because like this show, like Hector started that ministry. I started this show. I built it from the ground up. At the time we're recording right now, we just came out with episode 324. It was a member show. So I've been doing this for a very long time. And it would be a, a huge humbling experience for me to be, to be that convicted to hand something over. And the fact that he felt the the polling like that, you did too. And then he humbled himself enough to follow through on that leading. I think it's really cool. I really do. Uh, and we're talking a lot about Hector. And I just want people that are hearing this uh, that maybe never heard that member show. Maybe they're not even members. If you're interested in Hector, though, in this ministry, uh, what was the ministry called again? It was a uh, prayer. It, it, it was, the Centurion, was it? The Centurion 813. That's what it was. That's right. Uh, and that that's actually the uh, the email address, too. And I kind of, is that still the email address? Yes. Okay. Yep. So I want to put that out for anybody, because if you're interested in what you're hearing right now, uh, and maybe you want to contact this ministry. Uh, it sounds like Stephanie is the person that's heading the charge on it now, uh, but Hector's still very much involved, involved. I know Colin's involved in the UK. This is a global ministry now. And the uh, the ministry again is called the Centurion 813. It's a prayer ministry. And uh, the email is the Centurion 813 at gmail.com. That's the Centurion 813 at gmail.com. And just for people, because maybe you're not so sure how to spell the centurion, uh, obviously it's the uh, centurion is C E N T U R I O N 813. The numbers 813. So the centurion 813 at gmail.com. And you can contact uh, Steph- uh, Stephanie. Are you the one that handles the emails now? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, if you reach out in that email, you'll get Stephanie. And she is leading the charge on the ministry now that has, uh, how many people you guys got in the prayer ministry now? I know we have at least three. Is there any more? Yes, there's six of us. Okay. And are they, uh, is, is, uh, Colin the only one that's in outside of the United States or is this more people outside the U.S.? No, Colin so far is the only one from outside the U.S. However, those that we're praying for, um, are looking for more and a handful of them are looking to either join our ministry or start their own separate ministry doing exactly what we're doing. That's awesome. And you guys are helping guide that process of getting that started? Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. So uh, to summarize, friends that are listening right now, Stephanie has gone through a a vast array of uh, spiritual attack in her life. And uh, it went through a lot of her childhood. And she kind of painted the picture as to, you know, what she's been through uh, that led her into going into the occultism and then how she got out of it. Now she's happily married and it's a it's a equally yoked marriage. And uh, she's now heading up this ministry, which is a very powerful mi- prayer ministry. And I can say that because I experienced it myself, not my personal physical body, but I was in the presence of my brother being healed. And to this day, he doesn't have any issues as far as I know. I'll probably ask him again today when I see him. Uh, so Stephanie, thanks for joining us here on the first segment. Uh, if you're a member, hang tight. Just go to the website, to the overtime segment, and there'll be a whole other overtime segment with Stephanie right there, right now, waiting for you to listen to. Uh, Stephanie, thank you very much. Mm-hmm.